to open up in your own computer. Select browser. This introduction to Python yesterday, July 7th, and um, we highly recommend it. A uh, set of notes by J.R. Johansson. Uh, it covers the basic Python, it covers the basic video as well, um, specifically the NumPy lecture and the Matplotlib lecture. NumPy is the super layer on top of the basic Python, providing uh, functionalities regarding scientific computing more than. Uh, the core of Python can provide, and Matplotlib is the plotting library. Both of them will have, will give you a, a, a memory of the MATLAB signatures. So a lot of functions, a lot of ways of calling it, a lot of ways how it works, will be somewhat mimicking the MATLAB behaviors. Um, these examples is what I would like you to open in the first place. So if you click on the examples, you see a web page here. You have some instructions, and you have a bunch of code down below. So I'm telling you that this web page can be used in two different ways. One way is that if you don't have, if you you don't want the fanciness, if you don't uh, have the the uh, this correct setup to actually use it as a Python script, you can just view it as a web page. But if you want to do a little bit more, if you want to follow up while I am coding and executing the commands in the web browser, and you want to do the same on your own computer, you can do that as well. The way is, if you uh, follow our uh, previous lectures, there's one lecture from Git. So if you have this software installed uh, and go to your command line interface and type in git clone this guy, I assume you have already gotten this uh, page open, so just select it, copy, and paste it to your uh, command line interface. So go, make sure you go to the safe and quiet directory and type that in, and if you want to uh, delete that afterwards, do that as well. Um, when you type in this command, and you see a progress bar, and you say that it has already downloaded this um, folder, or GitHub repository, and type in IPython notebook. Be sure that you have already had your Python whole environment set up already. And uh, if you type in that, you'll be directed into this page. In this page, you can see uh, I have two folders, but you probably have only one. And just click into the scientific Python walkabout and click into the, again, scientific Python walkabout.ipyfd. This is the notebook. If you go through this on your own computer, you can actually run the scripts inside of the web browser as if you were using Python to do the real programming. So it gives you a, an advantage of doing some manipulation. If there is any uh, problem setting this up and uh, you still want to do that, please tell me. If you don't, it's perfectly fine. You can just remember, you can always just go to this web page and just click on the examples and you'll see that as a web page. And web page for our purposes, for now, is good enough. And this one and that one is not high and that probably lectures by this guy, J.R. Johansson. I'm going to review it uh, in the first part of our lecture. Uh, this lecture is going to maybe take more than one an hour, and let's see how it goes. I haven't had experience of uh, timing it. So I'm going to first start with NumPy and assume that we already covered that uh, yesterday. At least did a quick review or, or just a quick review. Uh, NumPy lecture um, from the link NumPy in the web page. And if you go in, let's just 
quickly browse through, and I'll tell you what that means. Don't care about that, because you have to go to lecture four to find that out. And uh, so Joseph may have told you yesterday, if you are here, that this command basically imports a lot of different functions and stuff from NumPy as a library. If you don't do that, you won't have the access to uh, the nice scientific computing that Python offers. So um, it's not the only way to do that, but uh, it is doing that anyways. And maybe if you were here yesterday, it is not the recommended way of doing this when you're writing your own code. But as a demonstrated pro uh, procedure, as, as a seminar, you're definitely welcome to do that. Because if you close this web page, um, uh, things in your memory will be gone. I mean, not your memory in your head, memory in your computer will be gone, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, there are a few ways to create NumPy arrays. I want to dive a, deep, a little bit deep into the difference between a NumPy array and a Python uh, original list. So, before, but before that, let's just finish this list. A Python list can be used to create a NumPy array. Also, a Python tuple can be used to create a NumPy array. If you want to know what that is, Let me create a NumPy list, sorry, Python list. And what is this? Is this, this is one, two, three. And the way you convert it into a NumPy array is to say, um, let's change this a little bit to. If I import NumPy as NP, I can have access to all these functions by say in np.array. And I by using this way, I can create a NumPy array B and print it. What's the difference? Well, the way it's printed out, there's no huge difference. As you can see, there's only maybe one comma or two gone. And uh, it's displayed a little bit differently. But there are two different objects. So if you want to say, you see that one class, it, what is the uh, one ob the uh, uh, Python list is the instance or object of the Python class list. And NumPy array is the instance or object of the NumPy and the array. So how is it different? You might, has, you might have already known if you uh, read through this. And if you haven't, you can always do that afterwards. Um, this is basically doing the same similar thing. And you might have noticed that there's no MP dot array here, uh, just like I did here. It's because originally it was, what, again, from NumPy import everything. It, the fact that it's importing everything implies that everything underneath this NumPy uh, namespace is important. So you only have to call the array something. You get the same result. That's why I have to be cautious about this, because you never know what you imported by saying this. There are some, maybe some garbage, or, or some names that will uh, override what you have already in your, in your memory, and you can't control that unless you track it in this namespace called np dot. So if there's np dot standard deviation, it will never override the standard deviation function that you already have in your namespace. If you're curious about what namespace is, maybe just to, uh, do a Google search afterwards. Uh, so I'm going to move on. This is how uh, you can create a NumPy array from a list, a Python list of tuples. And you can use a function and uh, create a list, and you can read data from files. So second part, use a function to create a list. Oh, by the way, create a NumPy array. By the way, NumPy arrays have a lot of properties like shape. And you can see it's, this, 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 this thing, print for, comma, it's not an integer on its own. It's actually, it's what, it, what it's called a tuple. So 
to show you what a tuple is, I can say uh, one, two, three. So I print, getting, uh, removing these green uh, prints, you can see it's a uh, uh, one, two, three, three numbers enclosed by a pair of prints. And this is what we call a tuple in Python. You might say that it's a little bit, easy, uh, it's a little bit uh, similar to what a list is, but there, there is some uh, not very subtle points that uh, you can find out by, uh, on your own, but I'm just telling you that it is a different data structure. It's one of the four or three uh, basic data structures, four basic data structures in and uh, you might want to know how to create a tuple with only one item. Would you do this? This is one pair of parents enclosing one number. Is it a tuple? Well, as it turned out, it's just a number. So, and, and you, we all know that a parent in usually in a lot of programming languages, it just basically means. Uh, of the priority of doing some arithmetic. So it doesn't really mean anything. The way to do it is a little bit quirky. You have to say one comma. With a comma, you will immediately realize that it is the tuple that you're talking about. And so you have this thing. When you see this, when you print it out, you know that it is a tuple having one element in its space. Just so you know. It will all be covered in uh, standard documents, so you can always be able to know. There's nothing that is not covered in the standard documentation. Official documentation. So, uh, a NumPy array has shape, has the size, and you can also call it by that way. Um, so, this paragraph, basically, J.R. Johansson is telling you what the difference between a NumPy array and a list. So Python lists are very general. They can contain any kind of object. You can create a list with the first element to be an integer, the second element to be a floating number, the third uh, element be, uh, say, a string. But they are dynamically typed, and they do not support mathematical functions such as matrix and dot multiplications without the help of NumPy, of course. Um, so implementing such functions to Python lists will not be very efficient. And so this is a deal breaker for scientific computing because a lot of code um, we're using this, this way of manipulating the, uh, the memory so that if you create a list or if, um, if you create an array or if you create a matrix in the memory, you like them to be statically typed. You like, them, you like to allocate just the right amount of info, uh, amount of memory to the thing that you are allocating, so that it's efficient enough, and you like to put um, the allocation space together. So, if you create an array, you like to imagine in a, in a, in your memory, if you have this much of space, if you create an array, you like to. To, to linearly or, or somewhat continuously store this amount of information out there. But not high list because it has to be, sorry, Python list, it has to be dynamically typed. So um, it has to sacrifice some of its uh, efficiency for flexibility. But not by array, they are statically typed and homogeneous, homogeneous. And the type of the types the type of the elements is determined when the array is created. So uh, you know this by saying by saying that if you create a list and if you convert that list to an array. And, uh, and here's a uh, here's a attribute of this array. You know that the things, the data inside of this array is typed integer with 64 bits, which, actually, which is uh, 
eight bytes. But if you create this list having a dot after the number, it will be read as a floating number. And a floating number list will be converted to a floating number not by array. And you see this float 64. A float 64 is a float with 64 bits, so eight bytes. It's large enough, usually. And if it's if it goes above, you are required um, required uh, precision or, or length. I think it will be converted into infinite. It is uh, one of the specifications of IEEE standard, um, and you need to consider this situation when you deal with very large numbers. So. So remember, if you have an array, you can say array dot d type, and it will tell you what type of data you are dealing with in that array. Uh, if you try to assign an array that is defined as uh, integer array or floating number array with a string, it will complain because it says invalid row for whatever because it is a string. And you can assign a string to uh, array that is already statically tied to B, an integer, or a float. So move on, move on, you can still, uh, you, when, when you assign this array, you can say D type is something. When it's complex, it is a complex number. So in Python, complex number is not, say, A plus B, I is A plus B, J. J, in this case, immediately following a number, without any spaces is not considered to be a variable, it's considered to be the uh, imaginary unit i in mathematics. Um, so so you, we, we talked about the first way of creating an array just by converting a Python list. Um, we can also use some functions. These are the, actually the ones we will use most of the time when we do some quick or sl um, slow manipulations. But a range is basically a way of saying that we start from 0 to 10, excluding 10, excluding the end number, with a step of 1. So what you created is actually from 0 to 9, because 10 is excluded. And how many, how many elements are there from 0 to 9? 10. And if you go from minus 1 to 1, and with a step of 0 0.1, there's another function. So, so if if you don't want to take anything away, take these two away. Uh, it's either a range, or if you are using np, it's the np dot a range. Three numbers to get that. And if you wonder uh, how you can obtain the help documents of some uh, some function, random functions, just say np dot some function or any kind of function, and with a question mark. We already talked about that yesterday. And it would pop up uh, very nicely formatted documentation. You can do this on the web page. You can do this on your command line interface. Um, and you'll see the calling signature and what that, what that each, each of the uh, argument means and what it returns. When you create your own packages, your always recommended of doing that. So we talked about a range and we have lin space, linear space. This one is a tad different. It, it basically says from 0 to 10, create 25 points. Not this step, but 25 points. And it will cover the n number. So a lot of them have its uh, origin from Mat a MATLAB. So uh, if you wonder why Sometimes excluding the end member, sometimes it includes it. Ask MATLAB, MATLAB developers, and we're um, probably not find a very satisfactory answer either. See, from zero to ten, all but both ends are included, and there are twenty-five points. This is how you create a two D. Uh, so if you're building a two variable. 5, 0 to 5 as x and y, it will have to create a, a somewhat a 2D array or a matrix to develop that. 
with one axis changing from 0 to 4, and the other axis stays the same, and that's 4 x, and another variable will become just a orthogonal situation. And in NumPy, there's a way to generate random data. Uh, you just say mp.random.ran 5 5. It basically creates a 5 times 5 2D array with the uh, random number from 0 to 1. And random n, rand n means it's a normal distribution. So we have some positive numbers, negative numbers. Um, it's a standard normal distribution with the uh, mean value located at zero. And there are a few ways to manipulate 2D arrays or you can think of them as matrices. To get the diagonal number of this, what, uh, this is from these three uh, numbers in this list, create a diagonal, uh, uh, create an array, 2D array with the diagonal numbers, the those three numbers. Uh, there are other ways. There are a lot of nice things that are already created, so what you need to do is to just explore the uh, official documentation. And uh, if you want to find something quick, just do a Google search, and I'm sure plenty of people are using this Python and NumPy combination, so it has a pretty large user base. And remember, and also take these two away. Zeros, NumPy, and P dot zeros, the three and the three, remember there are, there, there, there's a, two pairs of printed uh, prints. So sometimes it might annoy you about how why they create it. Some, when you are creating the random number uh, to the array, you have only one pair of friends, and here you have to have two pair of uh, friends. And why you might as well just have to live with that because they create it that way. And once it is created, it's difficult to change. And that creates a lot of problems because we we code by the names and by the columns. Zeros will give you an array. Remember, if you see this zero followed by a dot, it basically means it's not an integer zero, it's a floating number zero. It makes a difference to the machine, how it's represented in memory. So you have zeros, you have ones, and all these ones are followed by a dot too, so they're floating numbers. And this is how you get uh, a read in a file. Don't care about that, because this is not a Python function. It's just uh, use a press Exclamation mark followed by a command to, to just get some um, command line goodies. But this is a Python function. So get this mp.gen from txt, and if you have a data file, whether it's comma separated or tap, uh, taps, have, I can see that, separated values file, and you can read that in, and you can plot that. We'll go over the uh, map plotting uh, later, but as you can see, the, uh, the way of doing this is quite procedural. And we get a nice graph there. See, in that, uh, the file you said, is there are these for temperatures in Stockholm? Um, is, so in that Stockholm file, are there all numbers? Um, see, you can get away with um, the first line being the comment. And the comment will, um, I think, this um, this um, this function does not read in the comment and does not label each column. Okay. Preferably, you would want to do that because you know that this is probably what's the temperature or, or or some other. If it just shows you a a a. a chunk of files, or chunk of numbers, you wouldn't know what each of the columns mean. But, um, so that's also something I want to talk about later. It's, uh, it's realized not through NumPy, but through another higher language, a uh, higher uh, interface, higher package that is more user-friendly to do these kind of things. But this is just, uh, um, you can get away with one, you can skip one line if that line is not all numbers. And you can skip two lines and you can, so this function is very general. So you have, it has a lot of, I will show you, it has a lot of column signatures. Uh, names equal true is one of them. See, there are a lot of okay. default values, but you can always skip away from default values. And 
of that skip one or two. Moving forward, this one's not very interesting either. Oh, about how to manipulate arrays. It is a little bit different the way you, uh, the same way you manipulate uh, um, Python list. There are more ways of doing that. So the basic way is is to say, okay, if you have a matrix or a 2D array, you can say 1, 1. It basically gets the second row and second column, that element, because it counts from 0. 0 is 1, 1 is 2. If you ask me why is that the case, why can't we uh, count from 1, like Mat uh, MATLAB does, um, ask the uh, first wave of computer science scientists. So we have M. If you only say 1, in a 2D array, it will give you the first row rather than the first item. Sorry, the second row. I made that mistake again. And if you explicitly say uh, two indices separated by one column, you get the same number. So, one thing to notice M is a 2D array. And if you say M, the second item, you get a 1D array. It's still that array. But if you say, explicitly say 1 and 1, two indices, you get just a number. It's not an array. Basically, just downgrading its dimensions <coughs> from 2 to 1 to 0. But it's 0 is a point. It's just a number. And so this colon means everything. So if you say the second item for the rows and colon, everything for the columns. It basically give, gives you the same thing as M1. See, right? Same numbers. And you can say, if you want to grab uh, the, uh, the first column, just say all the rows and the second column. Column one, not the first column. Column one, second. And you can assign a number to a specific position. And you can assign a number to a bunch of positions. You can assign the, 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 this zero to the to uh, row one, every element. So basically, you're assigning all these to zero, and you can assign everything in the row column two to minus one. And you got minus ones and zeros, and this minus one overrides the previous statement. Uh, you can also use some nice ways. So remember this colon, and if you say one colon three, it basically gets you item number two. Uh, let, me not, let, let me not say item number two, just from one to two, and not including three. So this again, three is ex excluded. The end number is, is uh, excluded. So you have, if you just count from uh, the numbers, 1 to 2 to 3. 3 is not included. You have only two numbers selected. And in fact, you do have two numbers selected. Uh, you can also assign two numbers with two different values. Very flexible. And uh, if you use this a little bit more advanced way of doing two colons, first number is the starting point. Second number is the ending point. Third number is the skipping point. Step. It's just like uh, the, uh, the A range we talked about. First number, second number, the, the uh, end number excluded, and the step. All the way. If you don't say anything, it basically goes to the end. Why is it called fancy indexing? Because you can create a list or an array, and you put this list to this pair of square brackets, and you can index the first and second, uh, the, the, well, the second, third, and fourth rows of this array A. Any questions? You can create mask of, uh, of uh, true or false values, the Boolean values to uh, select the uh, numbers of the array as well. Create a mask of some Boolean.
equations. I put the mask into this pair of square brackets. And you can also use this where function. Uh, I'm showing you all these, not letting you just try to remember. You, I don't think you can remember that uh, from one go. Just to show you that these things exist. And uh, you can always go back to this file and to look it up and go to the standard doc to find out more. I guess this is uh, linear algebra. I'm not going to cover that because this is more of a math equivalent. And you'll find all you, what you, you know, all you need when you need the function. Do you know what you need? Say if you want a dot product to uh, vectors, you, you know. And uh, it, we will have a very intuitive name. It's called mp dot dot dot. So it's intuitive enough. Just remember, if you are multiplying two matrices or two two d uh, uh, two dimensional arrays, it's an uh, element wise multiplication. If you want to do the uh, dot product, you have to explicitly say np dot a comma a. We'll talk about that. Yeah, just like that. See? We'll talk about that. Okay. Some transformations that you, if you know math and you know all these, it's very easy to find them out. Oh, you can also do some statistics. You can find the mean value of that array and the standard deviation. And then the maximum sum trace product of all elements. Could you just take it out to where they say sum product? So, so D is, is that D is, is the, okay, that, that's not And you might wonder why is it doing that? Yeah. Why is it plus yeah, that's that's one? Right. Because there's a zero in it, and if you something about, if you just do a product of the model, it collapse to zero. So what does this do? You could guess d plus one. D is the array, and d plus one is it adding one to each of the elements or adding one to the first one? We can intuitively uh, guess. Each of those elements. Each of those, right? So it's technical, uh, technically broadcasting. So basically, if you're adding a number, a zero-dimensional data to a one-dimensional array, it will propagate to all of the elements inside. So it's, it's intuitive. You don't, you don't have to let me tell you that. And cumulative sum, basically, just adding one up to each. And it's 45 is the uh, summation of all the elements. Still retaining the one dimension. Grams, and dimensional data, and you can always reshape your data. Uh, I would have to skip that. Okay. Uh, some of the very uh, less visited tricks. How to stack two arrays. This may be interesting to you. Uh, maybe that of interest to you. If you have two arrays, have the uh, set, uh, have at least one dimension. Um, the same, and you want to glue them together, you might want to visit this section. Concatenate, or horizontal stack, and vertical stack. This, I will talk about copy and deep copy, but not on this web page. You have to go to the web page that uh, I just created myself. Iterating, um, won't let me tell you that, it's quite intuitive. Basically, we're kind of done with this file for now. And now let's move on to, is everybody on the same page as um, I am? Do you want me to tell you a bit where to find this one? Go to let, um, the web page of our workshop. Okay. The scientific Python and examples is what it is. So make sure that you have one copy. You can you can either run it in your web browser as, as a script or you can just view it as a web uh, as a web page. So you want to make some um, make some uh, um, 
make some reference to the other libraries. You have MATLAB and uh, NumPy does mostly that, your Pythonic MATLAB. And uh, SciPy is the scientific Python hack. It has say, Fourier transformations, integrations, uh, solving differential equations, um, and, uh, and statistics as well. Signal processing, linear algebra. So if NumPy doesn't have it, sometimes NumPy has, um, say, dot product. Dot product is technically uh, uh, an operation of linear algebra, but NumPy is basic layer, fundamental layer of scientific programming has uh, this function included, but it's also included in SciPy, and SciPy includes a lot more. So it's basically a, a battery pack to your phone, like thing. We'll talk about the uh, um, fitting function. There's a, there's a um, function called curve fit. Um, we would mostly use that to fit one function, like one dimensional function, or two dimensional function, or even a function with an integral. When an integral cannot, an integral, when an integral cannot be analytically solved, and matplotlib is um, so basically these three can be grouped together uh, to form your whole um, manipulation of data, like what you would usually do with matplotlib. And pandas is like um, what I just said; it's a higher layer, of just giving you a pretty viewing and flexible input-output um, um, capabilities, and also um, let you see the columns of each, the, the names of each column better when you import some data from files. So do we need to install it on Python? Uh, the Python? interesting thing is um, if, uh, if you receive our email, uh, the installation, just like that, oh. will give you everything that you need. If you, it doesn't matter if you work on your Windows machine in Mac OS or Linux. So pandas, you have it. Optionally, you can use SimPy to do some uh, symbolic calculations like what you can do with Mathematica. Well, Matlab and Mathematica are um, both paid software, and uh, all these things are free. So I will skip the installation, I assume you've already done it. And uh, this one, I'll tell you what it is, but I will not, be, I will not let you do it right now. So remember, each time when you go into Python, Every, not everything is important. And if you want to do scientific computing, for example, I'll get to a mail interface, and I'll go say hi Python. And you'll see that if I say numpy something, it's not showing up because np is not defined. I have to manually say import numpy or import numpy as np to get access to all the nice functions in NP. Of course, this will not work because SDF, ASDF is not a function. But I can, of course, say dot assumption. It will fail because there's no input, but at least it recognizes it, the existence of this um, NumPy library. So how would I make this thing, make these two things easier? I don't, have, I don't want to, every time when I get in, I want to do some uh, scientific computing, I have to type in import NumPy, import SciPy, import Pandas, all these. So there's a way, if you're using IPython, it's called profile. So look at how I would do this. I made a profile that it automatically Im imports everything, and it will print out some information saying NumPy is imported, matplotlib is imported, using matplotlib, some, the interactive mode, if you go to the you know, details about how matplotlib works, using custom research style, um, so what, 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 and I can say, uh, you know, also imported pandas. So if you want that, it doesn't take quite long to load that um, up front, but it's a very nice way to do that. And I recommend you do that. Uh, the way is to, to go through this small section and copy this bunch of information. I was edited the final row and uh, put, it, put it there. And next time you say I Python, you'll automatically load all of these. It is still legitimate Python, so there should be no difference, no difficulty doing that. So we're going to continue, and it seems that we have already exhausted 40 minutes. Um, a little bit of rehash of basic Python. Uh, it's a nice material to toil in the official documentations. Uh, also, the GR Johansson promised you to talk about the uh, copying of a copying uh, list or copying 
uh, NumPy array. Let's first talk about counting a Python list. So if you have a if you have a list, Python list, not not an array, not a NumPy array, just a list with three, four, five as the numbers. Uh, if you say b not equal, you assign a to a new reference called b, what would happen? If you print if b is equal to a, you will say that it's true. And this might surprise you, or it might not. If you, if you assign 555 five, five to the third element of array B, and if you print A out, A is different as well. So basically, basically when you change B in here, you're changing A too. Is that surprising? It is quite surprising, because you would assume that if you assign A to B, you're creating a new list. And if you change B, A will not change at all. But in fact, it's a usual trick done by a lot of programming languages. You're basically passing the reference of this A to B, but they're, they're basically referencing the same location in memory. So originally, you create an A, and it assigns a bunch of, location, uh, a bunch of memory space, and it's called A. The way you, you, can, you can get access to it is through the name A. And now you're assigning A to B, and you're basically making another reference, uh, referencing the same location in the memory. You might wonder why do they have to do that? It's so cumbersome and creates a whole bunch of problems, but it saves space. And usually when you pass on references, you don't want to create a whole other one. And there are definitely ways to create a, a new uh, list from A. It's here. So if you have A, it's assigned as 345, and for list, remember, it's not for NumPy array, and I'll talk about that later, but for a list, a Python list, say A, remember what code means, basically it means to slice everything, and slice everything from A to B, it very interesting creates another array, uh, creates another uh, list. So in this scenario, it is not the same space anymore. You create it in A, and you slice it, basically creates another one, it's called B. And they are different. If you, if you ask if B is equal to A, you print that out, and it's, it's false. It's not the same. And if you assign a number to the third item of B, and you print out A, A is not changed. So consider that the last lesson. So, anytime you're copying an element of the array, you're copying by value, but if you copy the whole array, you're copying by value. Yes, if you, you have to specifically say that the cutting uh, slice of it. But like I said, it's not true for a NumPy array anymore. For NumPy array, even if you do that, you still get a reference. You still are referencing the same space. It's um, a little bit intricate and somewhat unnecessary to remember, but it is how it is. Um, so it's also very important, this, this thing is very important when you try to remove something from the list. So, the wrong way to do it, if you have one, uh, one uh, uh, Python list saying 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 4, and if you want to loop over this list and to see if the number, uh, the value in it is equal to 3, you want to remove it. And you finally print it out. And look what happens. You get 1, 2, 3, 3, 4. You have four threes in the first place and you only remove two. And ideally, you want to remove all of them. And that doesn't Right, right? So, because when you are looping the array, you will try to. Suppose you have an array in the memory, you have 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 4, 5. And when it loops the array, it goes to test if 1, it first enters the array and then grips out the uh, first element, or the zero element, doesn't matter. And it will test if this equals the 3. And if it does, it will try to remove it. And it doesn't. So here it goes that way, and it goes here. And it, it finds out that the element is equal to 3. And it will remove it. And when it removes it, it changes the length of the list. When, when I said array before, in case I, I correct myself, I was talking about this. Uh, it, so it basically skips one element, and you can think about that later, so, but I'm only telling you that it, it definitely, it, it, it surely skips one element, and it goes here, and it will test that, 
and it will skip one element again. So if, uh, it's at the end, it only removed two elements, and we're leaving these two intact. And you'll go here and there. So moral of the story is you can't change the size of the array, the, how many elements are there inside the list, how many elements are there inside the list when you're looping over. So the uh, official documentation offers us a very uh, tricky way of, uh, of doing that, exactly by using this notation, a slicing operation. It creates a copy when you loop, uh, when you loop over it. So for i in this copy, and you test if this guy is there, and you move a. So basically, you're not looping over this thing anymore. You're creating a copy of this list, and it will loop over that. And this copy does not change when it's looping over it. And everything will be done to list A. So in that case, everything is behaving very nicely. One, two, four. Four threes are looped. Any questions? <coughs> Oh, you have to say, um, there's a way to test if a number is an odd number. Um, no, I want to remove an odd number of numbers. So, like, what if I wanted to remove three threes? So I wanted the string to just say one, two, three, four. Uh, you can, one way, as far as I can see, is every time when you move over with this, you make a counter, and when the counter hits three, you stop. In other ways, maybe a more cumbersome. You, every time you, uh, you ask this array how many threes are there left, and do it in English. But maybe the most straightforward way is to just put a count before looping over it. Count, count from zero and all the way to three. Here, forget that. And, um, so now, now we forget about all those, and we just move on to a new subsection. And how to iterate a list as index and value. Joseph talked about that yesterday. I'm just one, I just wanted to uh, let you uh, remember it. You have a list, and usually when you loop over it, you get the element, but you don't get the index number. But if you say something, something, these two elements, uh, these two uh, variables, the names don't matter. What matters is if you say enumerate this list, you have the uh, index and the value. And you see that's true. Index 0, 1, 2, 3. And if you have a dictionary and you want to uh, loop over this key and value, so the dictionary looks like this. It's one of the four basic Python data structures. The four uh, basic data, uh, Python data structures is list, dictionary, tuple, and set. And you'll see that uh, the key is x, number is 1, z is 3, y is 2. And you see, um, there is no, there's no ordering here. I initially put in x as the first number, uh, y is the second, and z is the third, but it goes through this, its own uh, ordering. So this is how we call it. A list has orders, and a list is mutable because it can change, you can change the, uh, the size of it, how many elements it holds. But uh, a dictionary does not have any order. It does, it, it, it can be changed. It can, it can always add a, a or B or C to it, but it doesn't have any order. It doesn't keep the order, even if you put it in the order. And if you want an ordered dictionary, you might have, uh, you might have to go find, uh, define your own super dictionary or somebody has already done it. Um, this might come handy in your scientific research. You have two lists with the same or one that has more members. If you say zip A and B, it will try to make it, so you have one, two, three as A, five, uh, four, five, six as B. If you zip it, it will try to create something like this with one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, it will try to move over in this fashion. So you have one and four to the I and J, two and five to the I and J, and I and J to the three and six again. And this is quite nice. With, uh, if you have NumPy, we're not talking about NumPy um, yet. If you have NumPy, you can always stack your uh, uh, um, 
this A and B in a way that is similar to this setup, but Python already has this in zip very nicely. So that would go to NumPy. So first of all, very good tutorials and docs. This tentative NumPy tutorial is this, uh, the uh, official documentation tutorial. And uh, this is the uh, official documentation. Every time if you have some questions about what a function means, you can either in your own uh, command line interface type in the function and put a question mark on it and it will tell you uh, right on the spot. But if you have a web browser, you can have a better multimedia display with there's some even some graphs that you can tell. And this way, if you're if you're an astronomer and or, or a previous Mat MATLAB or R user, R is a statistic software, you can always find a very nice uh, conversion chart that you can reference. IDL is a uh, language that uh, deals with astronomy data, and you can also use Python. So here is it's like in the description. It's quite long, so we'll definitely give you a strap if you already know one language. So that's what So now I'm going to proceed. I have to type in this. We don't have to know what uh, this map plot in line means. But what you have to know is I basically imported NumPy. Uh, Matplotlib's high plot as a plot. You don't know if you read that uh, documentation on Matplotlib. And you import tennis as PD. Um, I also imported, see, I primarily I wanted to uh, demonstrate the uh, power of the, uh, some of the set modules in SciPy. In SciPy, got optimized through this, a very powerful function called curve fit. Um, this function can fit any, almost any kind of uh, function that you call. It can inclu include an integral, it can, it can, it can fit a two variable function. Um, if it's a polynomial, NumPy has its own way to deal with that. You just say numpy.poly fit. So you can kind of say numpy poly, <laughs> do the uh, tap completion, it will tell you. It's poly 1D is a bunch of different functions to deal with uh, polynomials. And it's polyfit, ask what it is. It will tell you right away how you can fit a polynomial. You don't even have to use this curve fit from SciPy. NumPy has its in-house treatment. But if you are defining your own function, you might as well use um, curve fit. I, I've been using that the most uh, when I deal with Python. So I, this is my area of expertise, whether you are going to use that or not. I can tell you anyways. Um, NumPy arrays, a little bit more on that. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what each line means. You create an array, uh, it's called A0, and you can reshape it to two rows and three columns, and then to A. And remember, if you reshape something, A0 and A are referencing the same space in memory. So if you change A0, A will change. If you change A, A0 will change. And now if you print A out, you'll see you should print the uh, digit, digit type or number type of what is inside of A. You know it's integer 64 bits. And the item size is 8, so 8 bytes. 64 8 bytes. Listen, A size, the total size of A, there are six elements. And the uh, shape is 2 and 3, 2 by 3. And what A is, is 2 by 3 in the array. And, um, this representation is slightly different from directly printing A. Um, you know the difference when you uh, just do, do, do your do your command line interface thing a lot. And it's slightly different. Like this representation has more information. At least it's telling you that it is an array, it's a numpy array. Uh, slightly more information. And you can always put an array to a list, convert an array to a list. The list representation, it does not look like a matrix anymore because they're, it's all in one line. At least you can see that. Oh, same, num same numbers. Wow. Yeah. Um, this is called typecasting. So A was originally, well, it was originally an integer array. And now I'm typecasting it to integer array. So it does make sense. Let me just change it to uh, 
Let's typecast it to float and uh, print B. Well, it was not defined because I did not execute this. Alright. As we compare these two, and these are integers, and these, two, these uh, six numbers are floats. Sometimes you can do typecasting. You can even typecast a, um, a float or integer to a string. So the string represented it will be just a string. And you can tell you this. You get all the string representations with those markers. And uh, it will tell you that it is a string or unicode with a bunch of sizes. Let's not get to that for today. And let's, uh, for, for our sanity, I guess we define all the, the, both of A0 and A, and these are all the same from before. And uh, you can slice A to get C. So what, what I'm doing here, I'm getting from 0 to 1 and excluding 2. I'm getting from 1 to 2, excluding 3. I'm basically getting a small subset of this thing. I'm getting it here. Make a new, um, make a new array, two E array, and um, and C, A and C are both based on A zero, so the, the very uh, initial storage space. So if you, if I have defined A zero somewhere here, and I, I create an A with reshape, this and that is referencing the same memory space, and uh, C. You get a slice of it, it's referencing the same name space, uh, the same RAM space as well, the you know, memory space. So if you change A or B or C, or uh, if you change A0, A or C, all of them will change. This is an example. If you change C, 0, 0 or C, then A will change. It will see like this thing, just that. So this is uh, what I was trying to talk about. Uh, this is quite different from the slice copy of the list. If you make a slice of a list, you get a new list. And if you uh, if you make a slice of a NumPy array, you basically get the same same thing, the same uh, memory location. But how would you get a completely new uh, NumPy array? You do a copy. And in this case, D is not a E is not a E. So, so this is my last comment. You would think that if the slice of an A is not a uh, is still A for a NumPy array, why are they still not the same thing? They are the same thing because you, you just did a slice uh, you just did a slicing operation to an array. You're not doing it to a list. It's still referencing the same memory space. Why are they different? Well, it's just different. Just, just to so you know that you, you just, someday, you're so curious and you maybe bump into that and you go, what? And just remember I told you before, and I didn't know why, and our, but our reasoning still holds. Uh, you change D, you change A, because they're referencing the same memory space. But if you do a copy, it's an, it's an explicit copy, they're different. Is there a good way to figure out if a variable that you have is a reference to another one? Um, one way is, uh, this is maybe not very really, uh, robust because it's, it also gives me false and they are referencing in fact the same space. Maybe one way you can tell is just to create one from another one and change one, um, change one element from the one that you created, the, the uh, array you created and see if it also changes the addition of the In this case, we already know it's behavior quite well. Now let's move on to fitting a single variable simple function. The function is an exponential function with two different parameters. And we define an f. So the way we define it, the first argument is the unknown variable. The second and third are the um, parameters. And a equals to, remember, np dot exp exponential uh, of natural. E. Parameter B times 
the amount variable, and see if this is what we're using, the uh, linear space, and p linear space from 0 to 1, just, um, you just plug that x into this function, and you, you just, maybe, let's just create uh, two fake parameters, making a to be 1 and making b to be 2, and uh, this is, what I'm doing is adding a standard, um, what's it called, what's it called? Come help me, I'm from another country. Noise? Noise, oh, what kind of noise? Stand, um, standard distribution, normal distribution. There's a small normal distribution on top of um, this smooth curve. And you plot it. You see that this is your y ideal, and that is your y with noise. So ideally, since this is such a nice uh, normalized uh, normal distribution, you will still be able to fit it to a very close precision. And in fact, it does. So you say curve fit, you put in that f. What, what is f? f is a function. And um, the way you call a function is to put a pair of parents and some parameters, arguments to a function. But you can also just set this function as just a reference. So, so a function is actually a first class citizen in Python. So you don't have to put a pair of parents and some parameters. You just put in f as a function. You put this f function in, and you put your x and y. What is x? The x-axis. Y. Y is not y ideal. Y is the noise, noisy data. You put that in, and you pass the uh, return value to two variables. The first variable is called p It is optimized parameters, and p code is the uh, covariance matrix. Diagonal members of this is the variances of each parameter, and if you get the uh, square root, you get the standard deviation. So that's all you need, right? If you want to fit something, you know the uncertainty of it. And you print them out, you see the first parameter a is 1.07, not too bad from the deviation of 1, and 1.9 from the deviation of 2, so not too bad. And now, if you create your new y, the fitted values of y from x and from the fitted parameters, and you print it, this is how you print it, just issue two plot um, commands and you get the legend, right? And you see that the ideal y is very similar to the fitted y. This is what it was looking like. Basically, the two curves are the same, so you, you, you feel pretty happy about the result. I don't know about you, I'm pretty happy. And uh, so now, the second step, fitting a single variable function containing an integral. So we all know that this is this is just child's play. This integral can be analytically solved, but what if, what if it can be? Say, um, there's a very famous uh, integral with one of the integration of material science. Um, the, uh, the law about heat capacity divide uh, divide rule about heat capacity there's a uh, integral that cannot be analytically solved remember you be careful about my notation you have dx prime as the uh, into uh, the, 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 the number that I, the value the variable that I'm integrating by and it goes to the upper uh, limit as the variable it's the unknown variable so the, the way I do this is, so in SciPy, there's integrate and in quad, quad is basically, a, basically a, a way of um, doing numerical integrations. And now you have to define your function uh, really f interestingly. Um, well, it seems that uh, there are also a C and D. This, uh, this is just an example. There are, there are C and Ds uh, also accompanying this. So not only A and D parameters. I need to change that, but uh, at least you can see that the first line is about the same. You define a function. You have your first variable, and you have A, B, C, D as your unknown parameters. Um, the integrand function should be written within the function f because parameters A and B are available within 
you can't do it outside because there is no A and B defined outside of this function. And uh, you have to define the integrand to be A. And this axis is actually x prime plus B. So this is my comp. And this is uh, how the truth comes in. If the upper or lower limit of the integral is our unknown variable x, x has to be iterated from an array to a single value manually by u, because the quant function only accepts a single value each time. It might be difficult to understand, but consider this. If you have an array, a numpy array, and you send it to np dot exp to do ex, you will make a, this np dot exp will recognize your input as an array rather than a single number. As for sure, you can deal with a single number, but dealing directly with uh, dealing directly with uh, array is less intuitive. It's still intuitive. When you put an array inside of this, you, you expect you expect an array output with every single number uh, going through this function. But this quad function, integration function, does not have that. So you have to manually iterate over your input number. Because you know that x, as an unknown variable, when you fit it, you will, it was defeated as an array uh, created by your, say, linear space from 0 to 1 with 1,000 points. So you have to manually iterate over that. And of course, it will have an um, inefficiency issue, but that's, that is the way I deal with it. And I do the same thing. I create an x and create one ideal and create some wide noise. See, it looks like that. And, uh, if I do the curve fit, things will go through very nicely. <coughs> and if I plot the fitted values, I will see very nice. And the way how <coughs> you do a two variable function, say you have a exp b x1 and e exp c x2, I just created that uh, without any reason why you, know, you, want, you might want to ask me why I don't want to put a C in front of that. doesn't matter. The same way, the only difference is that you have to consider the fact that X would be a 2D array with two variables. How do you do that? You create X1 just the way you created X before. You create X2 just the way you created X before. And you put X1, X2 in a list as X. And you do the things just as the same one before, but inside of this function, you see that? It's like an internal implicit agreement. X have, it is now uh, has a first element and second element. The first element refers to x1, the second element refers to x2. So it's implicit in the way that you have no idea when you define it what it has. But you know that because you are the one who is fitting the function. It is like a, uh, it's like the uh, philosophy of Python, the uh, consent of adults. And you have, you will do that. You also have to use a special way of uh, building your graph in that plot with to, to make that happen. This is the original um, look of the, uh, this is the original look of your noisy data and uh, your ideal data. And if I fit it, it still works. You have your parameter A and B and C, and the fitted values and the ideal values. Very nice. So I think this uh, section might come up handy uh, for a lot of scientists because fitting stuff is what they do almost every day. Um, so there are some stuff of that plot if I want to talk about. If I can't finish them all, it doesn't really matter. Um, but just so you know, there's some of the, uh, the tricky stuff that I would prefer to just talk about rather than letting you hit the wall um, for a whole afternoon and there's no how. Um, let's say, I assume that you have already gone through this lecture. It's quite long. And it tells you there are two, basically there are two uh, interfaces. There's MATLAB-like API, there's uh, MATLAB-bit, 
object or an entity. You know. uh, if you haven't gone through this and you want to wonder uh, what they are, this is thing. Just assume plot is the place that you would initiate the plotting command. So plot, subplots one and two basically means one row and two columns of this graph. So you have one row, two columns. And you plot Say PLT plot two three four. This is the map. Uh, this is when, when I said pipe plot PLT interface. I'm basically referring to the map plot. Data. Sorry, MATLAB API. So if you plot this thing, on which figure would you think it is plotted to? It is plot second one or third, third or first one. You don't know, but the uh, program has its own way of, of treating it. It will it will generate all these. Um, Subfigures, uh, they're actually called axes, and you would try to plot on the last subplot you generated. So it looks like it looks like it automatically chose the right axis, not the right one, but the one on the right. And how can I plot on the first graph? And uh, so you can use this pyplot interface or matlab -like interface. Uh, you do the same thing and see. When you created this subplot, it will return the values of a figure reference and axis reference. Axis reference is actually, actually a container, and you, you, um, the container will contain will, will contain the first axis and the second axis or the subplot, second subplot. I'll just call them axes now. This SCA basically means change the current axis to the first axis, the first being on the left, and then you plot. So, it's my wonder what that really means. It means there's an implicit agreement on where to plot. The agreement is like a state that is hidden, but, but you have to know. When, when you create a subplot, it, the state switches to the right side, and you have to manually change the current, the current state to the first axis, the axis on the left, to make the plot. And this is the uh, typical MATLAB behavior. And you can also do it, use the object-oriented interface provided by MATLAB. It's very strange. I, I'd rather call it subplot. So, uh, so we initially changed, it, changed the current subplot to the, fir the, the first one on the left. But now, object-oriented interface gives you this capability. You have axes. The first axis, you can name it to another one, or you don't have to. And this axis, this reference, is an object. It has a lot of methods. One of the methods is plot. So in, in, now it knows you are plotting on the first object of the first subplot, and it will plot on the right spot. And uh, look at the comments here. If you are not using this Python, an IPython notebook, and have switched on interactive mode by PLD ION, ION interactive on, um, you don't have to want. You don't have to know what it is. It, I'm just telling you that um, it will matter when the time comes, and if you feel the discomfort, and you'll know where uh, how how you deal with it. And uh, I just like to refer to the documentation regarding background and the Everything is contained. Same here. It doesn't hurt if you do any of this. So if you're, not, if you're using this interactive mode, you have to, every time, when you use the um, object-oriented interface, that does not start with the PLT dot. You have to say PLT draw to update the figure so that you can have the updated version. The approaches, these two approaches have the same effect. And uh, so that was, two subplots. And what if you have two figures? You create one figure saying uh, plot figure in this guy, and you create another figure called two. So you also you also can see that it's quite flexible in terms of the name of the figures. It can be a string, it can be a number. And you plot this on figure one, you plot that on figure two, because every time you create a figure, the current state goes to that figure. And if you create another figure, the second figure, the current state 
jumps to the second figure. And if you plot here after this line, you will, you, you will be plotting on to the second figure. Now, how, how would you want to just go back to the first figure? You say that again, if it turns out. Plot figure, huh. and you say, you create another, you're not plotting a linear line, you're just getting some scatters. And you see that, yeah, the first figure has a line and some scatters. This second figure does not have the scatter. So it basically makes sure that it's plotting on the right place. And how would you add text and delete? So if you plot something and you want to add a text, and remember, this text, the first argument, second argument, argument is the x, y values of the data reference. So 1 and 2.5 basically means 1 and 2.5 as the left, lower left corner. And you can, you can change that to, to anchor it to the upper left or uh, upper right or lower right, but by default it's lower left. And you will say whatever it says. And you can see, also see that I can add some equations to it using a later or with tap. Uh, the way to do it is to put an R before the uh, before the string. This is not the most important thing. It's it's called a raw string. It basically uh, correctly escapes this um, back backslash. Usually, when you say backslash, you have to do two backslashes. But if you say raw string this, it will just be read visually without any uh, interpretation. Um, and uh, this is the, w w when you put in two dollar signs, the things in between two dollar signs, it's, uh, it's uh, identified as a text, a tech statement, and we give you that. So does this still work if um, we don't write an R in front of the uh, I'll show you. String there. Let's just make sure that it works. All right. And if I don't put an R in it, do why? Because this is not properly escaped. But if you put another uh, backslash to escape the first backslash, this is quite typical computer science stuff, and it will still work. And the reason why we want to put an R in it is because we don't usually see two backslashes in a LaTeX or tag statement, the syntax. We just want to keep it simple. And R does exactly that. It just saves you from the effort of that extra backslashes. And to delete the text, you have to go to a little bit length. You, you just create a plot. And uh, see, you don't have to create a figure and then create a subplot and then create a plot. You just create a plot. And it will give you the figure, give you the subplot, and it will draw you a line. This plot basically draws a line. Um, and you put a plot, uh, put a text in it, and this is how you remember when we going to talk about the current space. The current space is uh, the current uh, subplot or axes. This is how you get current axes when you don't have it already. It's called get current axes. And always, always pay attention to what the function returns. Sometimes the function returns nothing, and if you let a variable hold this nothing in return, you get a none, N, O, and E. It is a special um, saved um, keyword in Python. Basically, it's nothing. And you print none, you do not print anything. Um, so you get this axis, and it turns out that this axis reference has text as a list. And if you pop it, pop means get one uh, item from the end of the list. Get it out, so the list will have one less than value. And you pop it, if you don't save it to some variable, it's just gone. So it's a nice way to just remove one item from the end of the list. Uh, but if you save it, you will go somewhere else, but it will still not show up in the original list. And now, if you pop it, uh, and you redraw the figure by saying PLT draw, we'll talk about that just now. Every time you want to use the, uh, um, the uh, object oriented in your legs, you have to say PLT draw. Well, so it's gone. And so it's, it, why am I talking about this? Because practically, when you are adding uh, a text, you don't know how long you will reach. And sometimes you go out of space, you out, get out of the order. And you want to adjust it a little bit. You change this value to, say, 0.9 instead of 1, and 
0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.85. So you always have to just put a text in it, delete it, put a text in it, delete it, draw it, put a text in it, delete it, draw it, and see what happens. And this is exactly what happens in this manipulation. A little bit, a little bit unnecessary if you're so used to the, uh, using a mouse and to just drag your text somewhere here. And if it doesn't work, just put the left arrow, just go, 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 and right inside the border, fine. But this is, this is, it doesn't know. You have to manually put it in. Not a, it's not as smart. Um, so what is the default font size in Matplotlib? Um, it's defined in the Matplotlib um, configuration default file. You can customize that, but the default is 12. This type layout is a little bit smart. Sometimes we plot something and X and Y gets out of the border. And if you say PLT type layout, you can't see actually see it in the notebook because both of the graphs are nice. And uh, you'll know when, when it's not nice. And if you say plot type layout, the, uh, sometimes the intercalating uh, labels will be nicely formed. And uh, this is not very well known. I'm just telling you that if you have, if you want to add more of the uh, ticks on one axis or two, say when you plot something, you say PLT locator params and bins to set to a larger number. It's not exactly 10. Is it 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or, or 10 bins. But if you say 11 or 12, it will not will not strictly give you 11 bits or 12 bits. It will still try to give them nice numbers to it. So um, this was the original. If you say n bits equaling 5, it will give you something like this, even if there's only 4. So maybe from 0 to 5 or to 8 or 9, it will give you 4 bits. And if you go from 10 to a little bit higher number, it will give you basically double the size of it, as far as I can see. Well, it's not doubling. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. From zero to one is only two. So from one to, to five, two from two to five. Uh, so much about Matplotlib and pandas. So I really wanted to show it to you. You can find uh, out a good glimpse of pandas with ten minutes of pandas uh, on the official documentation. Official documentation. So the good thing about Python is the um, they so much care about the quality of official documentation. Each package, and they recommend the. Uh, uh, individual users, when they create their own packages, to do the same. Uh, you can always find out the, the, the help documentation from a function by just typing in the name of the function and with a question mark. You see that right on your own uh, web browser or uh, command line interface. And you can also go to the web page to, to find out the uh, officially uh, gathered documentation. So just to give you a glimpse. PD is pandas. I imported it. Remember? The PD read the CSV will get the CSV file. It can either be from an online source or from your own local file. And you, say, you can say input column to the ID. And so you basically know that in, in this file, in this CSV file, the first line will have a bunch of this ID, player, year, thing, team, LG or L. And the second line, starting with the second line, they're all numbers. And with the, they're all with the same column uh, numbers. So it knows it will, it will pull out the first row as the row for column numbers and will correct it from it. There's a lot, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, and uh, you can also read from an Excel file. This is also found somewhere online. You can print it out. You can see it's very nicely printed with the indices and the column names. This is pretty nice. And, and what is even nicer is uh, there are different ways of indexing. And it gets very confusing before you see that. Even after you see that, it still gets confusing after 10 days. And you have to get used to this way of doing things. I'm just going to quickly show you how it's done. You have this, and you have a column. You want to get column A out with the index. You can do that. Just this is the DF is the uh, the one I passed. Yeah. Uh, reference. DF with a very familiar way of indexing it with the square brackets. Uh, a, it gives you A, remember 
I kind of know it, it's uh, 0 0.098 something. So remember, you're on our track. And if you do DF 0 to 2, it basically gets the first two lines from 0 to 1 and excluding 2, the whole rule. Because it's the first two lines are over there. And uh, if you explicitly uh, select the, 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 uh, the row with the time uh, frame, with the timestamp 2000, uh, January the 3rd, you have the first row. But see, it, it's a little bit different. The first row has A, B, C, D, and now it's presented in, in a token. What if you don't have a, a label at the very beginning? Uh, so you can not skip the first row. Not to skip the first row. Oh, you don't have the label. Yeah, I mean, if you just have all numbers. Yes, uh, in that case, it will automatically treat the first row as the label row, so that's not very good, right? Uh, the way is to say header equals none. Default value of header is equals to zero, so it's the first row. And since you don't want to do that, that. Usually, it will try to have its own way of intuitively guessing things as the first option. And if you can't, if you, if you, if you itself can't tell, you have to do something. Uh, explicit row slicing uh, and included. So if you slice the rows with just the index numbers, the numbers, not labels, if these are labels with index numbers, it will not include the last element. So it will not include two. But funnily enough, uh, if, you, uh, if you do this explicit row slicing with the labels, it will include the second one. So if you do 2000 uh, from the third to the fifth, it will include three, four, and five. And why would you do that? And it's quite confusing. It's, it has a lot of tradition of how uh, scientific community or, uh, or uh, my, my lab users or, or the uh, previous scientists view things. So all these traditions will have to us have to keep on with the tradition. Uh, there are also ways to, to say, get all rows, column A, and you get all these, and you know that the name is A. Um, there are ways to explicitly uh, get an element by the row number, the, the row label and the column label, and uh, get it by position. This is, so this is a label, and that is a position. So if you get, a, get it from position, don't have to start from 0, 1, 2, 3, not the, the years. See, it's quite flexible because why, why can you read that? It's January the 3rd, 2000, but it's not written as January the 3rd, 2000. It's written like, as a sort of like a string thing, 2000-01-03, but it, it, it kind of knows that it's a timestamp and the input can be flexible. The whole reason about this library is flexibility and ease of manipulation particularly good if you are doing a lot of data chunking on your own uh, very quick, rather than, uh, rather than one. That, that thing basically made me play. Uh, okay, okay, let's move forward. Um, these ones, I, I don't want to show you anymore because it gets really confusing and unless you just read through the implicit rules in here, there's not much point because you won't remember. There are a bunch of references. Um, this one is what I highly recommend. And the, uh, <coughs> these two, this is especially for astronomers. He also teaches from the beginning with a different flow of doing things, way of doing things than the first one. And this is uh, the third, uh, very quite short compared to these two, um, complete lecture series. And I haven't. I haven't personally gone through this, but the quality of the first one, at least I can guarantee. I think that completes today's seminar, and if you have any questions. All right, all right. Where, um, where was the, the link that you actually found that from? The link of you, you're, The thing you're going off of there. This whole thing. 
What's that? Is this whole thing people on page? Yeah. Um, you can, do you know our uh, web page that the uh, workshop? I can read it off there. Right. Uh, maybe, do you receive our emails? Yeah. And it, it should be there. It's, it's not in an explicit form. It's a Google or short thing, but it should be there. Oh, uh, okay, that's fine. Let's play this one was work was not short. Right. right. You know, at least you can find that out. Maybe it's worth saying why you used to handle this over no five. Not I mean like a advantage of using handles over no five. Oh. <laughs> okay. And if you go here and 